complex systems. Recent technological advances have enabled scientists to take a closer look into the human and animal brain. Non-invasive techniques such as fMRI, EEG or MEG now provide us with very detailed information on brain dynamics with great spatial in the case of fMRI and temporal in the case of EEG and MEG resolution. On the other hand, microscopic dynamics can also sometimes be inferred using invasive techniques only allowed in animals like mice that provide simultaneous recordings of thousands of cells. This means that we have a lot of great quality data on the brain. Now, can we use it to understand exactly how it works? Well, we as physicists are tempted to study the brain using tools from statistical physics and disordered systems. Indeed, the brain is composed of billions of smaller units called neurons that cooperate together in a perfect way to achieve a specific goal, the processing of information and the elaboration of proper responses. Now, if this is the case, then all these small units can operate together in many different ways. For example, they could all decide to activate or fire at the same time leading to a completely synchronous regime, or otherwise they could decide to ignore the others and just fire whenever they want, producing an unharmonious regime of chaotic activity. A widely discussed conjecture establishes that the brain could extract significant advantages from operating close to a critical point, a perfect balance between the completely synchronous and the completely chaotic regime, an in-between of sorts. So, we have plenty of data, mainly composed of time series, and we have a conjecture namely that the brain is operating close to a critical point. Now how can we test that? What tools can we use to infer the distance to the critical point? What our research group proposed is to study the hierarchy of functional modes. See, time series that are critical are a mixture of many dynamical states, some of them ordered, some of them lacking any particular structure. If we want to decompose the time series into a set of independent dynamical states, we can use principal component analysis. If the system was to be completely ordered, then only one dynamical mode would be predominant, the homogeneous one, and the spectrum of principal components would look something like this. On the other hand, if the system was to be completely disordered, the spectrum of principal components would be completely flat, as all dynamical modes are somehow present. Now what happens at the critical point? Well, close to the phase transition, the spectrum of principal components develops a power law, a signature of a scale invariance. This means that there is a vast repertoire of dynamical modes present with hierarchically structured importance. Comparing this power law with the so-called Hu and Sompolinsky distribution, we are able to infer a parameter g that measures the distance to the critical point, with g being close to 1 whenever the system is about to approach the critical state, and g close to 0 whenever the system is at the disordered phase. However, principal component analysis does not take into account the temporal structure of the data, as it relies on studying the same time correlation. In many biological systems and in general, in many out of equilibrium systems, time plays a crucial role. Take these two simple neurons as an example. The same time correlation between them is zero, as they never fire at the same time. Whenever one of them is on, the other one's off. On the other hand, it's clear that there is a simple correlation structure in time, namely that some delay tau after one fires, the other will fire as well. Hence we went a step further and developed a new method to analyze principal components at different timescales. Let us illustrate it with a very simple example. Consider this stochastic process that has only two dimensions. This particular process is a mixture of a Gaussian process where the variables are anticorrelated that will create 
the blue points distributed along the ellipsoid that I'm going to show in the screen in a second. Plus, we're going to add a deterministic signal that oscillates with a periodic frequency omega sub zero around the red trajectory. When added together, these two signals produce the stochastic process shown in the screen, where one can distinguish by eye the existence of a characteristic oscillation. Again, just to refresh, I will show you the Gaussian process in blue and the deterministic signal in red. If we were to blindly perform principal component analysis, we would observe that the principal components that I'm showing in white in the screen do not align with either the deterministic signal or the stochastic process. It mixes information coming from both of them. When we apply our method at the longest time scale, zero frequency, the system is dominated by the Gaussian process as the periodic signal just vanishes. On the other hand, at the characteristic frequency we recover the periodic signal. Because this technique works in the complex plane, principal directions are no longer linear manifolds, but rather curves. Thus, our method is able to disentangle these independent sources of variability, just by filtering the appropriate timescales. Let us get back to the human brain. We will apply our technique to a dataset composed of MEG time series from control subjects together with Parkinson patients. First of all, we decompose the time series into individual frequencies by means of the Fourier transform. This will give us a resulting process in the frequency domain. Then, we calculate the correlations between units and look at the hierarchy of principal components at its particular time scale we find a very broad spectrum that can be well fitted to the whole Sampolinsky distribution to infer the distance to criticality at each particular frequency. We did this and find out that the timescales that are closer to a critical in healthy subjects are the longest timescales, together with the so-called alpha band, an interval around 8 to 12 Hz. On the other hand, the presence of pathologies like Parkinson has a great impact in this behavior. Indeed, these pathologies are such that there are no longer clear peaks in the distance to criticality near the alpha band, instead a vast repertoire of close to critical bands appear. Let us observe that this behavior could not have been reported just by looking at the slower timescales as previous works have done. Indeed, the behavior at omega equals zero is practically the same for both groups. Furthermore, our tool also allows us to take a closer look at the spatiotemporal patterns or principal components at each band. These patterns are much like the different notes played by a string in a violin. The first harmonic, or the dominant note, is the most important pattern, as it is the one that explains most of the variance in the dataset. Somehow, it is as if the sound of that particular pattern was louder and follower with our music metaphor. Just as a comparison, let me show you how these notes look like in the actual brain, compared to the strings of the violin. Just like it happens with the musical notes, the first harmonics tend to look simpler, and following ones appear a bit more complex. Now, coming back to our previous discussion, this first note or dominant harmonic is strikingly different in the healthy control subjects compared to the Parkinson patients, where there exists a higher level of synchrony. This technique hence proves that this particular disease has a huge impact on the way that the brain transmits information across different scales. Following with our music metaphor, it seems as though the brain of a deceased individual needed to be tuned back again to the original key in order to produce the desired sounds. In short, we have proposed a new technique to investigate timescales beyond the slowest ones, namely the frequency-dependent principal component analysis, FDPCA for short. Plus, we have applied this methodology 
to a dataset composed of healthy control subjects and patients with Parkinson's disease. Our results point out that there are striking differences in the dynamical regimes of both brains when observed through the magnifying glass of this framework, differences that would not have been uncovered otherwise. Not only the distance to criticality was found to be different across scales, but also the main spatiotemporal patterns or main nodes that the brain is playing. As a short teaser, spoiler alert, we're now working on building dynamical models that are capable of reproducing these empirical findings. And surprisingly, we have already found that we best fit the data when the dynamics are set close to a phase transition between a synchronous regime where there is only one predominant tune and a chaotic regime where all tunes are playing at the same time.